Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast and the Finding Genius Foundation. I'm Andrew Suarez. He's a professor in the Department of Entomology uh, he works on uh, ant ecology and such issues at uh, University of Illinois. So, Andrew, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. It's my pleasure being here. Yeah, tell me what, what got you interested in ants and how long have you been working with them? Sure. So, yeah, I haven't always been interested in ants. As a undergraduate student uh, taking a lot of biology courses, I was much more attracted to working with vertebrates, particularly birds. I uh, loved uh, bird watching. And as I went on to, to do a master's, I continued working with birds, and I started working with birds as my as, as my as a PhD student in San Diego. But throughout the the process of kind of switching projects and honing kind of my interests, research interests, I got involved working with ants and uh, never looked back. Uh, I just found them fascinating, particularly their social behavior, the way they interact with with people in urban and agricultural environments, and then the important roles that they play in ecological environments as well. How have you seen them interact with people except to uh, eat their food or <laughs> yeah. bite them? Yeah, that's the number one question I get asked as an ant biologist is, how do I keep them out of my homes? But, you know, they're, it's interesting because not only are ants pests, right? They, they provide all sorts of ecological services that we benefit from uh, regulating populations of pest insects, other pest insects in, in your gardens or, or in agricultural areas. There are even some indigenous cultures that use them for, you know, food or for other other practices, medicinal practices. So they've kind of served a lot of roles historically, uh, in addition to just the insight they provided into kind of social behavior uh, as a stream form of a social organism. Well, so what are some of the benefits that they bring, for instance, in a garden and in other scenarios, and maybe a few specifics, and then, you know, we'll get more into their behavior? Yeah. So, you know, most ants are really generalist in terms of what they eat, and they will scavenge uh, a dead insects, uh, kind of cleaning up the environment. But they'll also eat live insects, many of which are, are pests. And so while some ants might tend things like aphids, which in turn are bad for your plants, it, you know, some will actually go around taking caterpillars off of your plants that would be chewing up the leaves. And so they're you know, potentially taking on the role of protecting gardens. And in fact, you know, the, the idea of using one organism to control another one that's a pest, we call that biological control. The oldest known biological control agent that I'm aware of are ants, these weaver ants that in Southeast Asia uh, were brought in, literally they're colonies which are arboreal, they live in these large uh, nests in which the, the larval silk is used to weave leaves together to enclose the nest. Uh, people would cut branches of trees that had these nests and then tie them into their gardens or citrus groves or whatever kind of groves they had um, in order for those ants then to forage on the trees and clean up those caterpillars uh, uh, protecting their, their crop. Interesting. So in what context do you study ants? Do you study local ones, you know, in Illinois, or do you travel to like a, you know, a rainforest somewhere and study them there? What do you yeah, do so your I, research? I have to admit, I love traveling. So I do do a lot of work uh, kind of globally uh, on different groups of ants. Some of the questions that, uh, that we look at in the lab involve what are the ecological roles ants are playing? How are the diverse community of ants, you know, that you see in, in particularly intact environments? Uh, what, what are they doing uh, for, for those environments? But I also work on a group of ants that we call an introduced or invasive, and in that they're they're native to one part of the world, but people uh, often accidentally have picked them up and then moved them somewhere else where they become established uh, and spread often with some economic or ecological costs. So many people are probably familiar with the red imported fire ant or the fire ant, which you'll find in places like the Southern United States, Texas and Florida, they're huge pests. They're not from the United States originally, they're native to Northern Argentina and Southern Brazil, but they were accidentally brought over where they, they proliferated and, and caused huge amounts of damage, you know, just multi-million dollar problem. Um, another one uh, from that same region of South America is called the Argentine ant, uh, which is the one I studied for my thesis and I continue to work with. Again, it's been, you know, was picked up as a hitchhiker with human commerce, it's moved all over the world providing an opportunity to understand the biology of an organism where it's from uh, in communities that it's co-evolved with 
and then contrast that to what happens when it gets moved to a new environment where it's interacting with now naive organisms where it might now be more, more successful and, and then cause economic as well as ecological problems. Yeah, I spoke to someone about uh, fire ants, and I didn't know that some ants had stingers, like bullet ants and fire that's right. ants. Yeah. yeah, it's weird. Do you know anyone that's uh, looking at the microbiome of ants? There are quite a few labs looking at that now. Uh, for example, Corey Moreau, who's a professor at uh, Cornell, does a lot of work with the microbiome of ants. Uh, there's Jacob Russell, who's at Drexel, as another person doing a lot of work with microbiome of ants. And their work is fascinating because there are about 15,000 species of described ants, and they vary a lot in terms of their biology. Army ants, for example, are incredi- incredibly predatory. They, they are out there hunting for other insects. While other ants, they live in, in trees or, or bushes, and they rely on plant-based resources for their diet. Things like you know, the, the sap that comes out of a tree or, or that is extracted from the tree by an aphid, which it then exudes as honeydew that the ants drink, uh, that's incredibly carbohydrate rich, right? It's like pure sugar, but there's very little other nutrients in there, low in nitrogen. In contrast, if you're eating an insect diet like an army ant, you get a lot of nitrogen, carbon, but not necessarily other sugar, raw sugars. And so the microbiome of, ant, of ants appears to vary considerably with really unique taxa um, among different species of ants, reflecting their diet and what their nutritional needs are, which in some cases can be made up uh, by products of that microbiome. What's been uh, interesting that's, that's been observed by the micro, of the microbiome of ants? You know, have you looked at the microbiome perhaps that uh, interacts with the venom production? Yeah, so that I haven't, and I don't know anyone that has. Again, it's very interesting in ants. As you mentioned, some ants have stings and they inject the venom. Well, uh, many lineages of ants no longer have stings. Instead, they spray uh, the venom out, like um, these common uh, mound-building ants here in the northern Midwest, uh, in the genus Formica, they spray basically formic acid, right? Uh, Rather than uh, using a stinger to inject it. And so what we call venom in ants is actually very different depending on which ant you're talking about and what it's made up of, whether it's alkaloids like the fire ants or or, or large proteins like in bullet ants or something like that. They are doing very different things, targeting different organisms, different aspects, causing allergic reactions, for example, in fire ants versus breaking, punching holes in cells and, and uh, causing uh, pain in different mechanisms in case of the bullet ants. And so ant venom is incredibly diverse. We, we understand very little about it, uh, both what components are, are synthesized by the ants versus what might be modified based on diet or the microbiomes like that. That's a really interesting question. Are ants like bees that if they sting someone and it'll rip off their, you know, like their thorax or something or their abdomen and kill them? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, ants, unfortunately, for those of us who study them, uh, can sting over and over again. So they, they're not self-sacrificial like the bees are. What would be like the ultimate ant battle? Which two species would you, you know, be interested to see fight, but uh, they just don't have the opportunity to in nature? Or do, I mean, they do. Yeah, so the, there are some really interesting ants that are, I think would be interesting to observe fight simply because of their size. So the bullet ant, which is Paraponera clavata, which you can find from Central America, like Panama down through Northern South America. Again, you know, really large colonies, really large ant, very painful sting. As you go further in South America, you know, again, picking up in northern South America all the way down to Argentina, there's a different uh, genus of ant called Dinoponera, which is actually even larger, although their colonies are smaller. And so those are kind of two giants of the ant world that would probably be quite interesting to watch fight. There are also uh, ants in Southeast Asia that have these really interesting physiologies to help them in their battles with other ants. For example, there's a, an ant in the genus uh, Campanotis, which are carpenter ants here in the U.S., that it's called the exploding ant. They have these really enlarged glands so that when they're harassed by other ants, the gland explodes shooting out basically a sticky substance that gums up the ant, the attacking ant, preventing it from continuing to raid or, or attack its members. And I've, I've seen them, these ants in, in Borneo, but I've never actually watched them interact in such a way that they start exploding, right? For lack of a better word, and, and having that sticky gunk come out. But I'd love to watch some of those really unique interactions. Yeah, yeah. Are there any that deliberately interact with humans? Uh, not as necessarily pets, but is there a species that it almost seems like they, they know that they're interacting with people and they do? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. 
please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Yeah. So there, I mean, there are ants that I would qualify as human commensals and that the way we've modified the environment in urban and agricultural areas in particular, we've created the ecological conditions in which some ants are very successful. They're really good at moving their nets in response to disturbance. For example, we water our lawns and they move out of the wet part and they can move back. Uh, they're quick at moving their nests inside of houses when they find resources like leftover jam or something on your counter. And, and so I do think there are ants that include some of the, the number one household pests in the U.S., like the odorous house ant, that, that basically have now become human commensals in urban areas. But there are, there are also ants that you know, are more pet-like. There, there's a species of ant from Peru, which is I think called the tropical hunting ant or something like that. that, that its genus is Giganteops, which uh, comes from its incredibly large eyes. It's one of the few ants that's really, really visual. And when you're interacting with them, it's clear that they see you and they respond to you as a person. So they watch you. They're very tentative around you. Uh, really? Stick your finger out. They'll jump onto your finger and see what's going on. So very oh, wow. different than a normal ant that's kind of just sensing the world with its antenna and chemical signatures. Um, Giganteops, you know, I would say of all ants is the one that probably would make the best pet because they're so visual. They will respond to your presence, either being afraid of you or being curious and coming up to you. We, we, we have colonies in the lab and studied their jumping behavior. Um, mm. And they're fascinating. They're one of the only ants that jump. And you can watch the decision-making process or imagine what it is in their heads when they're moving around the environment, jumping from platform to platform. Do they know the people that care for them? They bring them food and, and you know, nectar and things like that? Or I don't know what you feed them. But, you know, that I don't know. I, I believe there's some evidence that like wasps uh, and perhaps bees can develop pattern recognition to the point where they might be able to differentiate between specific people, caregivers, for example. But I, I'm not aware of any evidence of ants. Do you try looking these things in the eyes and just like staring at them? Or like, have you interacted with them much? I have, and not so much to kind of look into their eyes to interact with them that way, but definitely in terms of positioning myself or providing them, you know, uh, resources or trying to get them to jump on my finger and things like that. Yeah, they're really very capable for an ant, right? Much smarter than you would think. Well, the people that pet that take care of them, I wonder if they try to pet them or if they're too small or if they try to interact with them and, you know. I, yeah, I think they're them. too small and even larger ants. When you interact with them physically, I think they just get freaked out. Mm, interesting. Are there any ways to tag them, you know, fluorescent dye or anything where you can, you know, get a visual on where they'll go in their colony and what they'll do? Yeah, there are. So we, we've marked ants individually with paint, like color marking them uh, with unique combinations of color so we can follow individuals within the colony. Uh, you can even glue tags with numbers, unique numbers, uh, and now even barcodes. So there's some fascinating work done by Gene Robinson here at the University of Illinois and uh, one of his former students, Burrell Jones, where they put barcodes on bees. I think it was a thousand individuals in a beehive. And then every few seconds took a picture of the hive to look at the social network that emerges within that hive based on interactions among individuals, which ones are foraging, which ones are nursing, and, and how that changes through time and depending on the environment that you put them in. So computationally, we're at a point now where you can get, you know, you know, data sets that would traditionally be unwieldy, almost impossible to analyze. But now with supercomputers, you can keep track of all those in unique interactions among a thousand individuals over months, right? It's creating these, immer these amazing data sets at, at how kind of self-organized these colonies are and the emergent properties that come out that you might not have ever been able to predict just watching a few individuals interact in any one, one time period. So what kind of questions are you trying to answer about ants? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, at the moment, my, my lab has been really focused on using ants for kind of bio-inspired design, uh, which is a kind of a, a phrase that's becoming somewhat popular now. It's the idea of merging kind of biological principles, turning to nature to see how organisms do things in nature, breaking down uh, what they do into design principles that then we can use for human application. And we do this by teaming up with engineers who are the problem solvers in this case, right? They kind of merging biology and engineering. So for example, there are ants 
called trap jaw ants. They have incredibly long jaws, often longer than their head, large muscles that, that power their mandibles. And then they, they interestingly have a latch that holds their mandibles open, much like you would see with a mouse trap or a bear trap. So these ants are walking around slowly in their environment with their mandibles wide open like a giant bear trap. And they have these sensory hairs. And if they detect something with their antenna or with their sensory hairs that they think might be a prey item, food or, or a threat, they, uh, a latch gets pulled out of the way with an incredibly fast trigger muscle, allowing a huge amount of stored elastic energy to be released all at once. Again, just like a mouse crush. And these mandibles go flying forward to capture or, or crush whatever it is that they might have been hunting. And so using these really simple principles, right? You have a latch, you have a lever arm, and then you have a mechanism to store and release elastic strain energy. They're, they can produce you know, forces that are tens to hundreds of times more than you could with simple muscle contraction alone. And they can achieve speeds that are in the 50, 60, 70 meters per second with their mandibles, incredible velocities and accelerations, making them these little super predators of the leaf litter. And so we, we've been um, collecting these ants kind of all over the world and, and bringing them to the lab, filming them with high-speed cameras up to hundreds of thousands of frames per second to be able to carefully categorize the kinematics. And, and then we try to figure out what all the components are that contribute to their ability to amplify power, the role of the latch, the, the role of the spring. And our ultimate goal is to then translate that to, to, the, to those design principles into something, right? You know, perhaps robotics or something. And, you know, that's, I'm the biologist. I run around chasing ants and we're hoping to team up with engineers to, to then do the translation. You know, what, uh, what kind of pincer strength do they have in that arrangement? And, you know, because of the acceleration, like how powerful are their jaws? Yeah, so, I mean, the, from the, our perspective, these ants are still really small and their mandibles are very light. <laughs> and so if you put your finger on there, they, they'll strike your finger, it might pinch. That force might cause them to bounce off your finger and go flying through the air. Um, but it's not going to hurt your finger, right? And they're just too small. But if you're another small insect, you know those mandibles will will crush their cuticle or or you know disfigure them, allowing them to to capture that insect and bring it back to it. Interesting. What about uh, locomotion? Ants typically have how many legs, and do they walk in interesting arrangements or patterns? Yeah, so ants have six legs, like other insects, and they tend to watch with this. Um, tripod gait. So you have two legs on one side, one on the other, moving, uh, alternating. However, there are a few ants that can then jump, like the Gigantiops I mentioned. And so in addition to walking, they actually will jump around the leaf litter um, using four of their six legs to jump. And then finally, the, these trapture ants that I study can actually propel themselves with the mandibles. If they strike their mandible against the ground, they produce you know hundreds of time of their, of their own weight and force, and, and that will propel them into the air or backwards presumably so they could escape a threat or something. What are the typical sensory apparatus of an ant? You know, like we have our five senses, but what, uh, what senses do ants have predominantly? And are there ones that are hinted at that you, you're not sure that they have or not? Sure. So overwhelmingly, ants use their antenna to detect chemicals uh, in their environment uh, by touch, for example. They can touch another ant, look, uh, you know, sense chemicals on its cuticle and say, oh, this is a nest mate or this is a queen. Or another insect and say, oh, this is a potential prey item. After the antenna, the ants, some ants are visual, most are not, but they are very good at detecting vibrations. So through their, through organs of, uh, in their legs, most likely, they're detecting vibrations through the ground. And that's providing information. One thing, they also have sensory hairs throughout their body that can detect, you know, the direction that wind is coming, if something's breathing on them or something. One thing we don't know is if ants can hear. That's actually been quite debated. If the, and that is not here based on vibrations coming through the substrate, like through the, a twig that they're on to the ground. But if a noise is made through the air, can they detect those vibrations? People have largely argued that ants cannot hear, although there's maybe some evidence. Well, if they do hear, what would their ears be like? I thought in insects, they'd have like holes in their you know, carapace and I that's think right. they call them spiracles or something. Or? That's right. Unlike you know, mammals that have a, an ear opening with an eardrum and then nerves attached to that eardrum. While there are insects that have a very similar hearing apparatus, moths, for example, have an opening on each side of their body um, with a, a tympanum with two nerves attached to it, allows them to detect which sound, which direction sounds are coming from. Uh, ants don't have anything that complicated. It's likely they have a small opening um, that leads to a set of cells or, or hair that those sound waves would move. And then that would trigger you know, a signal that suggests that they've heard something. But it would be very, very rudimentary without having something like an eardrum. 
really limits what you can do in auditory. Can, has anyone been able to do like a micro dissection of an ant under a microscope? Oh yeah. A lot people have done a lot of micro dissections of ants, um, looking at, you know, regions of the brain, lobes or other parts, similarly of the abdomen, just to find out what glands are where, uh, what genes are being expressed in different parts of the brain or different glands. There's been a lot of really interesting neurophysiological work uh, and kind of genomic work done with ants that would require those kinds. Of- yeah, what kinds of interesting structures have been observed or, you know, genetically? I don't know, are there really any interesting genes that show up in other animals? There, there are. So there are, of course, sets of genes that all animals share. And then there are unique um, sets of genes on different lineages. One thing that people who study ants or bees or other what we call eusocial insects, those that are obligately social and that have a reproductive division of labor. So you have physically distinct queens and workers. Um, they're interested that there are genes that are somehow facilitating the evolution of a complex social structure, specifically with the development of a sterile worker task. Unusual, right? To have individuals that are sterile uh, is very unique in social in eusocial insects. And so trying to understand the genetic or genomic basis behind that developmentally, why does an egg, ba- based on the nutrition uh, it receives as its larva is developing, can, can either develop into a worker cast versus a queen cast. What are the genes that are being turned on to differentiate those two forms uh, is a very hot topic. Uh, any other really important questions you're looking at in regards to ants? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, I, obviously, I'd like to think that what I'm doing is important and interesting uh, in general in a lot of ways. But I appreciate that, as, as with most science, we're niche you know, people. We, we focus on very little things that very few others find interesting. But collectively, those little bits of information start accumulating and we start to get a better picture uh, of our environment and the organisms that are in it. And as we put more and more of what seems like esoteric information together, we eventually get to a space where we start seeing connections and, and those connections then allow us to draw generalities. And now we have insights that we couldn't have had without all of those pieces. And it's those insights that make the big big changes, right? How are, are humans modifying the environment and how are we going to continue to maintain an environment that provides the ecosystem services that we need, we need to survive, right? And so, again, while it might be hard for me to convince the average person, oh, yeah, I work with ants. This is interesting and important for a lot of reasons, unless I directly tied it into how do you keep them out of your house or how do you keep them out of your garden? Um, I do think that collectively the work that, that I and my colleagues do is, is really important for helping piece together ecological and evolutionary information. But what are what are some of the really important things they'll do in an agricultural setting? Do they I mean, do they act at all like earthworms and air at the soil? Like what, what do they do in, in terms of uh, gardens? Yeah, that, that's a, a fantastic example. You know, ant species vary in terms of where they put their colonies and how deep they go. And so by building colonies in agricultural environments, they are over, they're turning over the soil, bringing nutrients down up to the surface, or at least um, creating, make, potentially making them more accessible to plants. Uh, they're also bringing insects and other biological matter from across the surface of the soil down underground, enriching the soil. And then the, the tunnels themselves act as conduits for water, which can also help uh, increase water flow uh, deeper into the soil, making it available for plants. So ants, uh, in addition to being predators of pest insects, can also be incredibly important uh, by the way they interact with the soil for making nutrients and water available. So yeah, they, they're really important in so many ways. So what, um, I don't know, what do you think is, uh, what are some of the big leaps of understanding that you hope to make about ants? So in, in my own lab, I, you know, I'm, again, I'm fascinated by just the sheer amount of variation uh, there is among different species of ants. And I'd love to understand kind of why we see all that variation. What, what's the, what are kind of the selective pressures that have resulted in certain ant lineages uh, looking some, you know, being really large versus small or having giant colonies of millions of individuals versus having very small colonies. Um, I do think that some of the biomechanical work we're doing has the potential to provide insights for real world applications, again, through this kind of uh, bio inspiration that nature is providing for us to solve practical problems. And then, as I mentioned before, the other labs uh, more than my own who are doing work on kind of the genetic and genomic basis of complex social behaviors, I think can fundamentally uh, change the way we think about how genes and hormones and stuff interact to mediate social interaction. Because ants and bees and wasps and things are, are obligately social, you know, they're uh, as social as an organism is. And humans are another example of something that's really social. And we have interactions that are mediated by cooperation and aggression, and spite and selfishness. Um, that trying to look at the architecture that underlies those interactions and in something relatively simple, an ant has a very small brain, can give us insight as to 
how social interactions are, are mediated and, and what the consequences of them are in more complex organisms, potentially even. You think in an ant colony, um, is there literally a combined sensing, a hive mind? Well, or, um, um, there may be, but you have to remember, like the queen isn't in control of an ant colony, right? All the workers are autonomous units. And the, again, the workers aren't capable of very complex reasoning or thought. They're following very simple decision rules. If I detect this, I do that, right? If I run into a worker with work with food, that might trigger, f- take the food and feed the larva. Or it might say, oh, there's food outside. That's going to trigger me to change uh, my behavior to whatever I was doing before into foraging. So you can imagine all of these individuals are, are following very simple decision rules. They're mediated by whatever they're interacting with at one time. Collectively, right, when you put dozens, hundreds, or thousands, tens of thousands of these workers together, emergent properties of the system arise that you may never have been able to predict based on observing those simple interactions and decision rules. The flip side is also true. You have this incredibly complex system of a functioning colony of tens of thousands of individuals. There's a reproductive queen. There are nurses, caretakers, foragers, those that are defending the colony. They're digging and creating a very specific architecture to their nest. And that complex society has arisen based on very simple decision rules. And so if you're a computer scientist, there is so much you can learn, right? How do you take those simple decision rules and string them together to get something that is so complex you never would have predicted it based on those decision rules? And similarly, how do you take something that's incredibly complex that nearly impossible to describe and, and break it down into a series of... And so again, that's another way that people who are studying ant behavior can come up with the parameter or parameters that computer scientists can use to model these complex behaviors and emergent properties. Again, that's a very exciting kind of cutting edge area of research that people are doing now. Well, what are some emergent behaviors that just, that you just can't correlate them with individual ability? Well, I would say just because I can't correlate them doesn't mean others haven't. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll give you an example uh, with the nest architecture. Like if you think about a honeybee and they make these very regularly spaced comb shapes, right? With a little hexagon or octagon shapes, you know, hexagons all lined up perfectly. Now, uh, I wouldn't, I don't think anyone would argue that a bee is thinking, I need to make a hexagon shape and I need to make 10 of them and then another 10 and a certain, but it's following a set of decision rules, which is, you know, you you put the the wax together or or whatever materials the wasp or bee or ant is using to to make its nest. And it's going to do it for a certain amount of time in a certain way. And then when it gets another um, uh, signal, it will change. And so just based on do something until something else and then change in a certain way, all of a sudden you get this beautiful repeated uh, architecture of a colony. And so that I think is one way, you know, understanding what those decision rules are and then how they then translate into a, a much bigger pattern, particularly as you increase the number of individuals that are interacting and working on the problem. Uh, that to me is a very fascinating. Are well, there behaviors that, I don't know, they would require end-to-end communication, but the communication must somehow be happening through chains of ants in the colony and Definitely. yet they're cooperating? Yeah. So some ants, for example, if they're foraging, they will leave a, a recruitment trail, like a pheromone behind. So when other ants are walking around in nature and they make contact with the trail, they know which way to go, either to go back to the colony or to go find food. And so in that case, ants are leaving chemical information uh, so that other ants can learn from that information, even in the absence of making contact with the ant that was there previously. Other ants um, also will, will share information, but through direct contact. That information can be on their cuticle, it could be based on antennal drumming, uh, by exuding uh, chemicals from different glands in their body. And so they have all sorts of ways of of communicating and sharing information that's context dependent, that again will influence what another ant does uh, and again change those actions based on these simple. Yeah, I've seen a few ants lately. Um, One of my kids left like a Slurpee outside and there's a huge trail, trail of ants going to and from it for like a few days now. I left it just to observe it, but every time I go outside, I see this huge trail of ants going. And then um, the other day I was walking and I I moved a rock with my foot. And luckily I stepped back because like thousands of ants swarmed the rock all of a sudden. I figured there were fire ants. I'm like, oh, I'm getting out of here. Uh, Where where was this? What state? Oh, Texas. Austin, Texas. Texas. Very likely fire ants. Yeah. Lots of other ants, if you're in a more natural area away from human disturbance that you would find in environments where fire ants have not yet penetrated. So what, what's ahead for you, um, you know, with your research in the next year or two? What's the big focus, the trap jaw ants or are there other projects you're working on? That's right. We're doing a lot of work with trap jaw ants and, and looking at kind of 
how ant morphology um, is shaped by its ecological needs or how its environment shapes its morphology in terms of affecting its performance. And again, the, uh, our dream, of course, is to come up with simple design principles that ants use to maximize performance or to enhance performance that we might learn something from. I, I'm also fascinated by how recognition systems work. And so it's if an ant touches another ant, it, it can assess if it's from the same colony or if it's the queen versus a worker, even a forager versus a nurse. Um, if it's the same species or a different species, there's a lot of information that might come across in that chemical signal. And, and how those cues, those chemical cues that are used to differentiate all those different levels of being, right? How those arise, like what are the genes that make them and, and how are they modified and produced versus how does the brain work once it detects something to make an assessment? Do I act aggressively towards this individual? Do I act passively? Do I cooperate? I'm fascinated by that question. Uh, or those series of questions. How does a recognition system work? In our own bodies, for example, if a foreign substance comes in, you know, we have to be able to tell our, our immune system, that shouldn't be here. We should attack it. That's a foreign virus or bacteria versus, oh, no, no, that bacteria is part of our gut microbiome and actually very beneficial. That We don't want to attack that one. And those same kind of decision rules are being made uh, just you know, at a different scale or different level. And so trying to generalize how recognition systems work from identifying self and not self from the immune system all the way up to members of a colony so that division of labor arises and efficiency increases. You know, that, that is something I'm just fascinated by as well. You should task one of the graduate students to tame those big eyed ants that you can look into, you know, and see, maybe. They, they could be a great circus attraction. Well, I mean, what if you can interact with them and if they can recognize a particular person and you can train them to, I don't know, to do something? That would be pretty amazing. You know? Sure. There, there are people who have you, you've taken advantage of large cockroaches, for example, uh, and put in basically a, a, a circuit directly into their brain so that you can drive them, right? You trigger them to walk left, walk right, walk forward by giving them inputs into their brain that they would get normally from their own sensory. And, and then with a small camera, you can uh, now have a roach that you can get into the tightest of spaces, you know, looking for whatever it is you might be looking for, survivors and rubble. Uh, I do think there, there are a lot of uh, utility that insects, particularly flying insects, you know, have if you can get use them in, in effective ways. Is there any overlap from your days working with birds and ants? Do they interact at all? Their commonalities? They, they that do. There, there are them? birds that eat ants. That you know, or ants that tend to nest uh, or put or put individuals in the nests of birds. There is quite a bit of interaction. In, in general, though, I, I you know I'm interested in kind of all organisms, but you kind of have to focus, right? It took me a long time to learn how to identify different ants and how to collect them, get permits to go around the world and get permission to collect and export ants and permission from the Department of Agriculture to import ants. And so now I'm pretty just focused on ants right now because we have the momentum. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Well, very good. What, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? Sure. Well, I have a website at the University of Illinois. If, if you just go University of Illinois Entomology, uh, the, I'm also in the Department of Evolution, Ecology and Behavior. I have a website there. So my name is Andrew Suarez, University of Illinois. My website will come up. Uh, I haven't been keeping it as up to date as I would like, but that's where I, I tend to, to write about what my students and I are doing in the lab. We, we put links to our publications, links to videos of, of ant behavior that we're working on. Uh, you can also always send me an email if you have specific questions. So, yeah. Well, I have one last question. Are there any animals that, that keep ants or interact with them or hang out with them? You know, like ants will keep aphids. Are there any animals that keep ants? culture them. Yeah. So there are definitely ants, uh, animals that use ants. For example, birds will bathe themselves in ants. So the ants will crawl over their body, presumably to pick off parasites and things. There are trees that have specialized hollow parts for ants to live in. And then those ants in turn protect the trees from their pests or herbivores. But in terms of like keeping ants, I can't think of an example of that. There are definitely other organisms that live inside ant nests, hundreds, if not thousands of different you know, beetles, roaches, colembola, and things that live uh, obligately inside ant nests. I don't know of many ants that live obligately with other Oh, so ants partner with a lot of other creatures in their own nests. They're That's right. Pretty yeah. smart. Interesting. Uh, I guess one more question. Uh, wh who eats ants? I guess the anteaters do. I don't know if you've ever hung out with any anteaters. But... That's right. There are a number of, of mammals like aardvarks and anteaters uh, that will, they dig up ant nests and eat, particularly the eggs and larvae, which are not as well protected as the workers, which have a cuticle. There are birds, some birds that specialize on, on ants. But I would say that the worst enemies of ants are often other ants, right? That there are ants, like army ants, that are specialized on raiding other ant colonies and taking their, their larvae. And so I would say ants are probably ants. Sounds like people, you know? 
Yeah, that's right. Well, very good. Andrew, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been really Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.